I want to thank our sponsors, Athletic Greens, who created AG1, one of the most innovative packets of supplements, including 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. These ingredients support your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. I personally started using Athletic Greens and love the way I feel in the morning after I drink it. And I no longer have energy crashes throughout the day. And the best part is that it's delicious. The founder of Athletic Greens created AG1 because he experienced a ton of gut health and ended up on a complicated and expensive supplement routine to recover. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash yasmine. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash yasmine, Y-A-S-M-E-E-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one on one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well being, and spirituality. Today's episode is about living a creative life and the wisdom of the tarot card deck with Kim Kranz. Kim is a visionary artist, author, and creator of not just the Wild Unknown Tarot, but many other tarot card decks. She's a prolific creative influenced by a range of mystical traditions and has published three oracle decks and guidebooks, one memoir, an interactive journal, which I also have, and uh, five children's books. Kim's known as the queen of tarot and is completing her New York Times bestselling deck collection with the wild unknown alchemy deck, which debuts in June 2022. So Kim, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I have a few of your decks already, and I also have your journal, which I was so fascinated by um, because it really shares a lot about your own journey and your own life. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Yasmin. So Kim, just to kick it off, uh, can you tell us, what does it mean to live a creative life in your words? It's such a huge question. I've thought about it uh, I've thought about it a bit over over the years, and um, you know, just before the show, I was thinking like, what's the central, what's the central thing that wants to come through around this question? And for me, it comes down to attention. It's the moment to moment decision to pay attention to something that is in front of you or inside of you or in the world. And it doesn't have to be a painting. It doesn't have to be something that we consider, quote, creativity or, quote, art. But it's this choice of first acknowledging how powerful our attention is and that it's always aimed at something. It's always focused on something. And living a creative life, I, for me, is about honing in on that and really refining the art of my attention and deciding, you know what, even though it makes absolutely no sense in one way of thinking about life, I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes drawing an apple, studying the form of the shape and the texture and the scale of it, the contour. And I'm going to draw that. I'm going to focus my attention there because it matters. And somehow in those choices of first, I'm going to focus on this apple and then I'm going to focus on um, this relationship. And then I'm going to focus on making dinner for myself or someone I love. And then I'm going to focus on this other aspect of my life. Somehow in those step-by-steps, pretty mundane moments of life, I think the creative life is built through where we focus our attention. There's also an element of willingness that I think is very important. Um, Just simply being willing to not know the answer 
and to not know what's going to happen and to step forward with our pursuits amidst that not knowing. That's a huge component of creativity. That's such a powerful answer, Kim. Uh, And I'm so curious about this idea of attention, right? Because I think a lot of us don't really have very, um, let's say, focused attention spans. We we sort of are on in this social media era of of our limited attention span. So how do you how do you create space to focus on things that you want to focus on? Number one, because I think that's a that's a it's a practice. I think for a lot of people who may not have access to that capacity, it's something that comes over time. Like it can start with three minutes and it's for, it's first acknowledging like the three minutes is going to pass anyway. So I could be scrolling my phone for those three minutes. And, you know, it's so easy right now to get discouraged because it's like, you know, with prayer or meditation or the world is so wild and complex right now. And it's like, well, what's, What's meditation going to do to help the world? What's what's prayer going to do? What's It's too passive. I need to be doing something. However, if you take your attention and say, okay, the next three minutes is going to pass regardless. If I decide I'm going to focus my attention on my breath and sending a, a message of peace to myself and the world, that's a way to make a choice around... Um, you know, not scrolling the phone, but saying, I'm going to try this instead. And then you just see how it feels. You just test the theory. Like, you know, a a new listener who doesn't know me now, just, just test the theory and just say like, is this, is this woman like crazy or is this true? So just take your timer and say like three minutes scrolling versus three minutes breathing or thinking of someone you love or sending sending love to someone who's going through a hard time and then the proof is kind of in in the pudding so to speak and then you'll you can easily move from 3 minutes to 5 minutes 6 minutes 11 minutes Th- these are challenging practices for me too just to be clear about it i do my 3 minute practices in the morning and then some of them i do 11 minutes and then withdrawing i'll, I'll draw for longer periods of time um but it's like exercising. You have to build your capacity to focus your attention and shut out the noise just for that time being, just for that little section of time and say, you know what? All the critics all over coming from all directions, I'm going to put my attention on this for this moment of my life. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's such an interesting practice. I love that. So setting kind of like a timer of, of three minutes or five minutes and then moving into kind of longer stretches of time where we can focus our attention. And I was really moved by one of the journals that you created because in the journal, you actually spoke a lot about your own creative journey and your own creative process. And quote me if I'm wrong, um, but I remember seeing a spot in the journal where you had mentioned that you had done something creative and explored your creative world every single day of your life since you were, I believe, a teenager. Is that correct? Well, I had a very rigorous training in that I I, I landed upon a scholarship to a, a boarding arts school. So I had I had almost five hours of art training a day with a really intense teacher. And then I had my academics on the side. And I I had a extremely um like dedicated discipline disciplinarian structure to my teen years around art making and and so that really shaped so much of my relationship to drawing I mean speaking of the art of attention like our our teacher just had us drawing the the human figure from a model every day for one hour and it it mostly sucked and was confusing. It's so confusing. It's like the wrist, the wrist goes to the forearm and then there's the elbow. And then, you know, you're trying to draw this and you're just like 16, you just want to hang out. And (laughs) it it all felt so crazy. But when I look back on, on those times, she was helping me structure my brain so I could make decisions around I'm not going to pay attention to that I'm not going to listen to this right now I'm going to 
you know, hone this space where I can just be um, creative and very, very present with what I'm looking at. And if you walk through the Metropolitan Museum or any, really any museum or any place where there's a lot of art, you know, it clicked for me one day. I realized, oh my God, all these paintings are, are records of the artist's attention. They literally were just paying attention to this thing for a certain amount of time. And we're seeing the records of that. We're seeing the evidence and, and the beautiful result of attention. So if Cezanne doesn't pay attention to the lemons on the table, there's no painting. He has to at some point say whatever's going on in his life, like I'm getting out the paintbrushes. I'm, I'm doing, I'm going to do this instead of doing all those other things. To us, it just seems like a Cezanne painting that always existed, but it didn't always exist. He, he made it so through attention and reverence for the, for the lemons. I mean, how crazy is it to paint lemons in a bowl? It's like absurd, especially if you're trying to contribute to the world and the world is in really rough shape and you want to make a difference. What, what could painting lemons possibly do? And I don't have the answer to that question, but I am endlessly grateful that Cezanne decided today I'll, I'll paint these lemons. I'll pay attention to the shadow and the light. It, it, it paves the way for me to do that in my own life, in my own work. And I hope that then paves the way for someone else to say, you know, even though this doesn't really make logical sense, I'm going to work on a poem for 30 minutes. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means to actually be creative. I mean, do you think that everyone is creative and that some of us have different capacities? Or do you think that some people are literally just born with different creative skills than others? Oh, I think it comes in all flavors and sizes and shapes, just like, you know, the trees in the forest. But the idea you know, that the, the trees in the forest, some, you know, have it and some don't, it's just preposterous. They just like express it in different ways. And, and, um, you know, you could think of surgeons or doctors or researchers are, it, there has to be creativity at the leading edge of all of those fields or else experiments don't happen. And, revelations don't happen and new discoveries don't happen because the, we have to have questions you have to be asking and experimenting and be in a space of query and that that's the artist's job in a lot of ways is to ask what what if what if we do this what if this happens what will be the result what if i put you know india ink on in water and I use a ton of water. Then what happens to the ink as opposed to on dry paper? It's very different. But you have to have an inquisitive sort of nature in order for that experiment to occur. And that happens across all fields and disciplines in our world. It's definitely not just with painters. So I see creativity as like a, uh, a kind of quality in all of us that's either highly practiced or it hasn't been practiced that much or it may be shut down it may be sort of dormant but it's there mm, yeah yeah i think a lot of us are not given uh the opportunity and um it's really beautiful when people can start to explore that skill set in different capacities uh, so Kim, I want to talk a little bit about the tarot, which you are known so deeply for. Um, I spent a lot of time in San Francisco and I can just anecdotally say that I have a lot of friends in my circle who have your tarot card decks. And I'd love for you to maybe talk a little bit about what tarot is. We have a big audience of people from over 70 countries, so they may not know what tarot cards are even. So maybe you could just define what they are first and, and also why you think they're important. Well, I like to get very nuts and bolts about it and just talk in terms of the logistics of the deck. So the tarot is... 78 cards 
which all have different meanings and different images that are paired with those meanings. There's four suits, and those make up, like like a deck of playing cards does, um, what's known as the minor arcana. And then there's 22 cards that are kind of known as like, you know, the trump cards or the overarching power centers. And those are called the major arcana cards. And those cards really track uh, big moments, big universal themes in everybody's life. Time, they're timeless. They're complex. And they're very powerful sort of concepts to work with, such as um, death and, you know, the lover card, the magician, the world, the sun and the moon. These really big, huge sort of cos- cosmos, you know, very grand scheme cards. And the minor, minor arcana cards are powerful too. They are related to the elements. Each suit is related to a different element. So I think what's important to know is that these 78 cards over time were kind of honed in a very grassroots way by people that were using the deck, you know, a few centuries ago. And eventually it landed on this structure of these 78 very particular words and concepts. And then each artist comes along and adds a different image to the cards, but the themes stay the same. So the tarot's power in in my experience really comes from the power of those themes. And then the magic that occurs with the pairing of the image with that theme. So my specialty and my interest is really around image and the power of image and what happens when it's paired with a concept or a word. The magician, for example, when that is paired with in the wild unknown deck, this leopard that then has the sword and the, the, the pentacle and the cup and the wand. And it has this sort of look of knowing and uh, ability, yet this like quiet nature, but it could pounce. There's infinite potential in, in the, in the magician's, um, repertoire, so to speak. Yet there's a stillness to the magician kind of waiting. And, and so the image itself and this idea of the magician activates something in the card reader or the querent, the person coming for a card reading. And, and the, the psyche is activated. And so these 78 cards are just absolutely excellent, almost like psychic acupuncture points or needles, 78 needles, that can go into our psyches and stimulate and bring out these aspects of the self that are perhaps forgotten or unknown, whether it be a gift or a kind of, um, you know, tough, complex, complex thing. And they're just incredible kind of characters that, that, Anytime I, I flip a card, I, I'm, I'm amazed. They, they work. They really work. So, so know that if you're coming to the, to the tarot, it's a, it's a system that's been honed like by the people for the people over time. And I'm, I feel blessed to have contributed to that sort of lineage of, of card, you know, card usage over the years. And what about um, the alchemical piece of it? I mean, why do you think alchemy is important? Well, the new deck that I have coming out this summer in July is, so So as I described, the tarot deck is 78 cards. It has a set structure. And then the other three decks that I created are more known as like oracle decks because they have a new structure. There's a theme, but they don't have this um, predetermined 78 card setup that the tarot has. So when I created Animal Spirit, I, I set up my own structure for how the animals were divided and how the cards were divided. And, and then with the archetypes deck, that was the third one. Again, I set up my, my own kind of system 
for which archetypes would be included and what categories of archetypes were included. And this fourth and final forthcoming deck, the alchemy deck, is sort of the culmination, or I think of it as like the grandmother of all four of them. It feels like um, both the destination of all four of the decks and the origin point. So it's this like beginning and end. It feels like the deepest um, delve that I've taken and in a lot of ways, it goes back to the very essence, which is the elements of the world. So it's based on, you know, the fire, water, ether, uh, earth, and um, fire, earth, ether, water, and and sound like I'm spacing on one of and them. Air. But air. I'm like, did I say an air? air. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the difference between air and ether is a whole podcast in and of itself. But um, anyway, and, and it also has the planets in it and the metals that are associated with alchemy. You know, this idea of turning lead to gold in sort of medieval um, European alchemy. And, and so it brings all the decks in a way back to their very origin because the tarot is reliant on the elements too, but I just wasn't quite ready to delve into that realm when I was drawing the tarot. So in a way, if you look at the deck sequentially, it maps my growth and my studies as much as anything, anything else. So, so alchemy has just been like a, a, a beautiful sort of, it's not an end point. It, it's like a culmination or, um, I don't know, a, a, a sort of gathering of all the different teachings I've learned from different wisdom traditions and putting it into one, uh, one work. Hmm. And so Kim, what inspired you to create each of these decks? I mean, they're very different from each other and, um, just, you know, kind of curious if you could walk us through like what, what was your inspiration for each of these? The tarot deck was in many ways personal. I, I made it for myself so I could have a deck that I felt really close to and connected to because I wasn't finding the images that I wanted to see, even though I knew the concepts of the cards, I, I couldn't relate to how the cards looked. So as a very visually particular person, I was like, I, I guess I'll just make my own deck. <laughs> so that was almost to f- fulfill a personal need. And then when I, when I saw how well people responded to the animals in the tarot deck, I realized how they really, as symbols, help us get out of our sort of stories as humans and think, you know, on a more grand scale and a more holistic scale about our life on earth. And so I delved into the animal spirit deck, which came next. And then I, I started trying to figure out, you know, why, why do these decks work so well? Why does the tarot work so well? And then I started to study Jungian psychology and I realized that archetypes are what actually fuels the tarot. These big universal concepts, these big, big themes, and that the tarot relies on those themes. And so I thought, well, I have to make an archetypes deck. And then when I started studying archetypes, again, the, the, what, what's fueling archetypes in many ways is this alchemical presence of the basic elements of the world, like fire, water, earth, ether, and air like the actual world that we live in, it comes down to such basics. You know, how hot is the the tea water when you make tea? It, it has to be a certain degree or the tea doesn't steep. And alchemy teaches us that. Alchemy teaches us about how magical it is that the body stays at 98.6 degrees without us having to do anything consciously it brings us back to those really really basic teachings and in that way we start to see divinity everywhere and um it helps us feel like we're part of a whole sort of ecosystem and a whole cosmos that needs us to be 
to be present to the to the world that we're in and um it's very very inspiring and empowering to to start using the lens of alchemy to see one's life through that perspective tell me about how the tarot card deck may have impacted your own kind of thinking about a decision in your life and perhaps like how maybe stories that you've heard from people because I, you know, it's interesting. It feels like there's a lot of different camps of people who are really interested in using tarot kind of as like a symbolic representation um, of a, of a d- big decision. And then others, I think who kind of maybe use it for more, maybe, you know, getting out of their own linear thinking, not necessarily to make a decision, Yeah. but I'm just, you know, yeah, curious, like, what are some of the ways that you've seen people use the tarot card deck? And and perhaps you can even tell us a story of someone, maybe yourself, um, that used, that got like a card that impacted a decision. Many, many years ago. It was a, probably one of the first editions of the deck that I had in hand, maybe even before it was made available. I was married at the time and I was wanting to, I was thinking about getting pregnant and just having a lot of questions around that. And I was on this long drive and I thought, I'm just going to draw one, one card. We had stopped at like a rest stop or something. I'm just going to draw one card for, um, you know, should I have a baby right now or whatever? I I wouldn't ask the question by the way, in that way at this time, it it was, (laughs) it was a sort of flippant way to handle like such a huge topic. And I got the nine of swords and I was alone in the car. My partner was like out doing something and I looked at it, you know, and, and for me that, that card always has a a kind of frequency around like anxiety, insomnia, a kind of unsettled, um, churning. That's very, very uncomfortable. And of course at the time it was like awful. I just put the card back in the deck, like, Oh my God. And, um, you know, it's 10 years later and my challenge with having a child and becoming a biological mother has been one of the, the great, um, challenges and deepest kind of acts of acceptance in my whole life. And it's certainly not because of the card. When I look back in it, I know that that card still, when I think of it in my mind, and I just thought of it a couple of weeks ago, it reminds me that patience and trust and that more anxiety, adding more anxiety on top of anxiety is not going to help. That I can think about it archetypally and universally and know that my struggle in this is one that is universal uh it it has happened to mothers and women across all cultures in all centuries and if i look at it as a way to build more compassion for myself then i've taken the card and i've turned it into a great teacher that can just remind me like this is a a point that is challenging in my life and then I can you know go back and perhaps like after this podcast I can draw a new card for that this new chapter of my life and say "Well, well what do you want to show me now and um it's not easy to get those tough cards around things that we're really sensitive around But I believe the tarot shows us not what we already know and not what we want to know, but what we need to see at that time so we can grow. And I do know that forcing motherhood in that dynamic and in that relationship and that phase of my life would have brought even more anxiety and restlessness at night and that frequency of um, kind of being um, 
really dis- distraught. So I, that's a complex example, but it's the one that just kept coming to my mind. So I thought I would share it. Thank you so much for sharing that um, really vulnerable story, Kim. I r- really appreciate it. And I think um, I think many listeners and many people who have used the tarot card deck have seen cards that they're not exactly excited to see, but also um, are helpful in terms of understanding the entire kind of scope of our of our world um, that we may not be paying attention to. I also um, about six months ago or so had pulled a card that was a pretty big, I think it was the death card. <laughs> um, and it pulled the, the carpet right under me as well. So, um, yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I've, I've had, I do the year ahead spread every year for myself. And I remember one year I had like, you know, I've had the death card in the center as the theme of the year. I've had the devil card in the center. And it's like, God, this is really intense. <laughs> but I, I always bring it back to the cards aren't going to show us what we, what we already know. We don't need to know about the like exciting romance that's coming over here in February. It's going to come these, these good and bad th- things that we perceive as good and bad are going to keep coming anyways. The tarot really is this like beautiful sort of preparatory. I think of it as like an ally you know, that nine of nine of swords being a kind of ally, like remember to like get good sleep and relax and, and do what you can to support yourself because this is a really big challenging thing for you and like take it so easy and kindly on yourself. So it's, it is possible to flip these cards and think about them as teachers. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. (laughs) Yeah. I think in society, we're always kind of primed to move towards like the light and the kind of joy and the, the happy, happiest moments of our life. As, and, and we sort of don't want to look at the darkness. Or we don't want to look at the polarity of the other side. So there is, you know, there's just a lot of inquiry around moving through this, this type of space in order, in order to kind of grow and evolve. It's important. And I think a lot of people would prefer to kind of ignore it or avoid it. Uh, myself included. (laughs) So same, same here. Although I know just from the logistic, logistical practice of drawing that in order to draw something that has form, you have to use shadow. If you're going to make a sphere, you know, you could draw a circle, but if you're going to make it a full voluminous sphere that has depth, the only way to do it is through shadow. So you literally take the darkness of the pen and you put it on the lightness of the page. And that's how image is made. It requires contrast and polarity. So we can't draw with a white pen on a white piece of paper and expect to see anything. There's literally nothing there. You could even just say it's blank. So let's not move towards blankness. Let's move towards depth and volume and, you know, the the image in front of us that we're holding or that's in us is full and rich and dynamic. And that, that has to be made through the balance of light and shadow. Mm, that's so powerful, Kim. Yes. Yeah. The blankness is the alternative if we don't incorporate the shadow and the darkness and the depth and the richness. I think that's the the word, the richness, the sort of juiciness of life comes from the shadow. Yeah. It's so funny. It, it, a page is blank. It's just a blank piece of paper. But if you were to say, draw light, the only way to do it is to use the dark pen and to outline and make that star through out the outline of of darkness and then the paper comes alive and you have a star in front of you but you only use dark ink to do it so i i i think of that metaphor all the time in the wellness industry in the spiritual uh industry uh, or spiritual communities um because it's just such a practical way to say like we have to not only pay attention to, but become craftsmen, become very good at, at utilizing, um, 
and understanding the shadow and how to build light from it. Mm, yeah. So Kim, where did you learn your philosophy from? Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? And, uh, you know, I know that you went to an artistic boarding school, which you mentioned uh, in the beginning of our conversation, but I'm curious, like, how did you end up there? And then how did you sort of move through the space? You're a creator of so many different things. So can you tell us about your journey? Sure. I'll, I'll try to, um, I'll try to, it's very hodgepodge. It's like a, it's like a collage really. I think of myself as a collage maker. Um, so it's like cutting out, you know, these little snippets from here and there and, and putting them into one sort of image or one project. But when I study something, I study it very, very dutifully. So, um, some of the things that I have studied, I'll just go through it. Like a list is, um, you know, first and foremost, drawing, and uh ceramics and and sculpture that's that's my main background and then i studied creative writing i double majored and um and and went to new york city and got my degree in being a jaded new yorker (laughs) (laughs) in the art world um i did that for a while and but kept drawing you know the whole time and writing and then i started to study uh after hitting a real bottom, um, yoga meditation, breath work and mantra, I really delved into the breath work and mantra. So I was studying like classical tantra and then went to an ashram and studied there and kind of went deeper into those teachings. And, and then I was led eventually to Pacifica Graduate Institute and studied Jungian psychology, um, and alchemy and archetypes and the mandala and um, started to kind of piece all these systems together and also studied, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a 12 step sober artist. So I studied Al-Anon and the 12 steps and um, that has contributed to my, to my work. And in some ways though, it's more subtle. Um, It's not necessarily something I talk about that often. And then um, I study currently um, Kundalini, and again a lot of mantra work through through that. And and I also I've done what I can to study music and you know piano lessons and kind of seeing where do all these systems, whether it's music or mantra or or art, what's the overlap between these wisdom traditions. And that feels like I want to be balancing right there. I, I've also studied a very beautiful lineage of, of shamanism in, in based in, in England. Um, that's based on the bee, the, the study of the, the honeybee. And that contributed to a great degree to the alchemy deck, um, down to the shapes of the cards being hex, um, it kind of in homage to the, to the, structure the sacred geometry in the hive you know the hex-shaped honeycomb and a lot of the cards have bees in them and and roses and and serpents which are also part of that lineage so um it's a very it's very beautiful like hodgepodge collage that i've kind of woven over the years but i love all of it too it's all too rich to to try to choose one and say that this is the perfect system i always study a system until it starts to break down or the people teaching it start to like um (laughs) dissolve in front of my eyes and either um you know either through in in the case of my first drawing teacher she she passed away when i was quite young or there's maybe some discrepancies in their teaching in the case of you know kundalini yoga yoga and yogi bhajan you're seeing like oh i how do I even follow this master when there's all these like, um, you know, just a, a terribly complex history with his, with his power. And, and, um, I'm speaking about it vaguely, but, uh, you know, anyway, I, I like to study these systems in, until I see them start to reveal their own cracks and fissures. And then I know I'm like really getting somewhere and I can, I can, um, see it all fall apart again and I can study something new and um keep trying to weave it all back together I mean sometimes I feel like a lunatic trust me but (laughs) it's like um you know I 
I've learned at least to trust where there's energy and to know when I feel energy from something and, and to just keep following that. That's so beautiful. Yeah. The, the inspired kind of action taking, letting the energy move you through that space. Uh, so Kim, I'd love to also know a little bit more about your morning rituals. Like, do you have a, a structure for the morning to sort of get into your flow and get into your flow state? Do you take time off? Um, I think a lot of people are just fascinated by highly creative people and, and sort of what goes on behind the scenes. So I'd love to hear from you what your kind of rituals, what your, what your morning is like and how you create the space for creativity. Well, first I, I would like to say, I don't, I don't have, a. I live solo. I've been living solo through COVID and for the last four, four years. And, you know, I've really wanted a family and, um, I've wanted the kids that my friends complain that their kids wake them up in the night and they don't have any sleep and they never get to practice. And I really want that, but that's not my reality now. So I've just decided, well, then I'm really going to practice. I'm really going to utilize this opportunity that my friends with families don't have in order to really get up and practice. So my practice is a little like cuckoo. Like I do a lot, but, (laughs) um, and I don't want it to sound like crazy for people who do have families or have a different work schedule. I just don't simply don't have time. Um, but right now, and especially during, during COVID, like living solo, I needed to get enough, you know, prana activated in my body so I could get through the day and, and not be so confused about what was happening. Um, so I get up, I get up very early. Um, and I do a lot of chanting in the morning and breath work and some practices I do, you know, for three minutes, if there's listeners that really have you know, only three minutes. It's just do breath of fire for three minutes. You can find it all over. It's in so many different lineages and and wisdom traditions to get the navel center activated and get the breath activated that leads up to clarity around the, uh, the third eye. You know, they call it the skull shining breath and it gets the pituitary online and um, brings brightness to the, to the face and clarity and to the thinking. So there's, you know, my practice is, it's longish, but it's built with these little, little bits. Um, I do the addiction meditation and Kundalini. You can also Google that for five minutes a day um, to help with just things that come up in my life that I feel I still have that draw towards that I can't quite, um, uh, I feel like I don't have, you know, control over. And um, that, that really helps me. And then I do movement, uh, a lot of different forms and dance, whether it's dance or, or asana. And then I play piano as much as I can. Play piano or harmonium is kind of my newer, um, newer horizon. So that sounds like a lot, but, but really I think the important thing to do is in the morning, get prana in the body and get the body feeling vital and confident so that we can move through our day and at some point around like between 1 to 3 p.m i have to do something to regroup because otherwise i just want to sleep from like 3 to 6 p.m because it the, the things are so confusing and <laughs> and if i've been on the computer all day it's like you know it's too much so a, a little bit of breath work there um, even if it's like a, a five to 10 minute thing to just, again, reestablish the relationship between the navel and the the mind. Mm, wow. That's, that's a powerful morning. I am so, I'm actually very curious about this addiction meditation. Um, you said it's like a Kundalini meditation. Yeah. It's super simple. It's, um, your thumbs rest in, on the temple and, um, your fingers curl in it's hard to describe in a podcast, but the hands come up and the thumbs are on the temples, the elbows are up and you, um, you set the teeth, the back molars, and you just pulse the back molars as if you're like clenching, you you know, don't do it hard, but you're clenching a little bit in the back molars and you're just repeating, um, 
sata na ma on each clench is a different a different um syllable so sa then ta then na then ma and um it it really works i i have you know for listeners who've read um blossoms and bones which is a graphic novel of mine that came out years ago a couple of years ago um i struggled with a eating disorder uh, in my mid later 30s after after the divorce and after the the loss of uh, of some sequential pregnancies and it kind of erupted into this uh c- control i was trying to have over my physical form and um body dysmorphia and or- orthorexia or orthorexia is is how it sort of manifested and so that meditation along with a you know several other things and just time in and of itself being a healer it's really contributed to my um to my recovery wow that's powerful i'm sure that people listening will be very interested in that and so you can check it out on uh youtube um and uh, you know i'm i'm curious uh, by the way thank you so much for sharing your vulnerability cuz i think a lot of people uh who are in a space where they are living alone um you know i, I think that the, the the idea that we you're making the most of your day and you're getting the prana which for those who who don't know what prana is it's life force it's energy in, into the body being able to manage your energy and not your time i think is so important um because i think a lot of people generally try to work through the day and sort of get really beaten up by the end of the evening and are exhausted. And so I just, I really appreciate that you have these stopping points and that you're listening to yourself and that you're creating the space to, to put the body in a position to be fully alive and fully present. So I I love that. And I'm also curious, you know, I think that there's this uh, idea that to be a great artist, that you have to spend a lot of time by yourself. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, is this work very solitary? Uh, Do you collaborate with others or do you just get your inspiration um, through your meditations, through that kind of like the field of the collective? Well, again, I'm kind of working with, with what I've got. I mean, there was someone over at my house the other day, they were looking at my work and they were like, wow, so you just want to be all alone all the time so you can do your work. It, it all requires you to be alone. And I was like, um, <laughs> it's not really like what I want exactly. You know, again, I, I do, I am in my own way um, praying for and hoping for like the relationships and family that will that will um, come into my life and and be the the right energetic fit if I'm blessed to have those things and um and so one of the reasons why it's so great to be finishing the wild unknown series in the alchemy deck is because that has been such a solitary pursuit you know drawing those decks and researching and it's been pretty intense um for the last decade making that series and now I'm working more collaboratively which just feels so amazing I just finished uh, recording a record with with a producer and friend of mine and just seeing what happens when the two people come together to make something is that feels like the next horizon for me and I'm also working to bring Blossoms and Bones the graphic novel that I mentioned um, beforehand I'm I'm working on a script with a co-writer of mine and we're bring, trying to bring that to film in the next year. So that is going to require me to work with, you know, many, many people. And But even collaboratively writing with him, co-writing and co-directing, it's like, it's very exciting to me to not carry so much, you know, this feeling of responsibility around my work and and also just see what happens when different minds and different beings come together to make something. It's so fun. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you are a a woman of many talents and, um, you know, I too also have a lot of different projects and like different areas. And so I don't, it's rare to find people that can, that have that much range, um, from a creative perspective. So I, I love that, that you're, you know, exploring all these different avenues for, expression and creativity and how beautiful that you're collaborating. So Kim, I'd love to know like what sort of things have surprised you since you've been on this journey. I mean, I am just 
shocked and in awe of the power of the tarot. I had no idea what I was getting into when I drew the deck. And I remember when I first opened Insta, not first opened Insta, but one day when I opened it and I started to see how many people were using the Wild Unknown Tarot. And I think it was the day I saw my the first person who had gotten a tattoo of it, one of the cards. And I was like, oh my God, this thing has so much momentum. And and I still am shocked by it. It's not even it's not just the wild and unknown tarot. I'm just speaking about tarot in general. It really works and moves people and opens up conversation and changes things and allows the reader and the querent to go into this very beautiful kind of magical space. And it's been doing that for a couple of centuries now. So I'm just in awe of it. And I, you know, bow down to it over and over. And now the Wild Unknown Terra, I think it's in nine or 10 languages now. And that is just absolutely absurd to me. I'm like, how could this possibly be? And so I'm in great uh, reverence for the for the people who over time honed in on you know, the tarot back in what, you know, whether it was Italy or what, whatever part of Europe it, it, it was that where it, that first deck was really created, which we don't know exactly how it happened because it was so, so grassroots. Um, but it's very, very, it's very, very mystifying to me. That's been one of my greatest surprises. I had no idea what I was, what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so impressive. Amazing. And what do you want to tell people who are listening about their well-being, wellness, you know, in relationship to your work? Like what's sort of your main takeaway? Uh I, I think my my main takeaway would would be around um just being wa- watchful around when perfectionism slides into any of it whether it be art making or tarot reading or breathing practice or your meditation or it sneaks into mine all the time. And I, I sometimes think if I do more or if I do it, you know, more better then I will be more and I will be more better. And, um, that's just a humbling practice. I have to return to again and again is like, this is not a perfectionism game. It's, not attainable and it's not my path it it's a it's a kind of painful paradigm that's been that's been placed upon us and i think we have to be very active in knowing when when it's not helpful when it's sneaked into the into the day and into our minds and our hearts um and that you know, the, the path of compassion and a kind of open-mindedness around who we are and, and where we're at in our lives is, um, for me, the way to go. That doesn't mean we, you know, fall asleep into Netflix and just say like, oh, I'm being compassionate. It's like, no, (laughs) get, get energy into the body, do what you love, you know, keep doing things that you love. And when perfectionism comes in, just notice it and you know don't let it don't let it turn the thing that that we love into a kind of uh competitive a comparative uh landscape Mm, beautiful amazing i love that message so much um yeah and i completely agree just the movement and getting energy in the body i'm going to really remember that because i think so many of us can just easily forget you know that we just go on with our lives and the energy needs to constantly be redirected, refocused, managed. <laughs> yeah, it's not a it's not a cerebral thing. It's it's an energy game. We're we're in an energy game on on Earth, and I don't mean that in like flaky energy. I really mean like how much energy is in the body and in the breath, and can the mind think clearly if it doesn't have enough, you know, oxygen and vitality? And mostly, no, it can't. It can't make 
I can't make the decisions. So, um, you know, if you want to do more of what you love with your life, you, it's going to require more energy. So some, some kind of practice that helps build self-esteem and confidence and clarity. Um, and we can't do that by thinking. We can't do it by researching, Googling stuff. It's the physical body is our, to go back to alchemy and alchemical terms, it's the laboratory. It's the first and last experiment, you know, place of experiment that we have. And it's our home. It's our alchemical home. So we start there as alchemists and as artists and as seekers. We start with the body. Beautiful. Wow. Kim, it was so lovely to talk to you. And I'm just uh, so moved by our conversation and also how you show up and, and your authenticity and your vulnerability. And I'm just, I mean, it shows that it shows through your, your output and your creativity uh, as well. So are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you and where to buy the tarot card decks that you've created or the journals that you've created? You can find me on Insta. My personal feed is Kim underscore Kranz and my website's kimkranz.com. And you'll also find content at The Wild Unknown related to the, the decks in particular and The Wild Unknown's Insta feed. Amazing. Amazing. So uh, thank you so much for your time and for our audience. Thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about the tarot and how to live a creative life with Kim Kranz. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Thanks again.